you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, we're going to need you to stay there for a while too. So if you're using your electronic copy of God's Word and not playing video games or something, uh, you should find that easily and quickly. Matthew's the first book in our New Testament. There are a few Bibles as well and a number in your program to get you there quickly so you can look at uh, chapter 1 of Matthew's Gospel. Now, it varies, but most of us, we're going to say, have some level of love for our families, okay? And we thank God for our families, and we know them, and they know us better than just about anybody else is going to know us. Uh, the fact is that the people we call family are our source of our some of our greatest joys and can inflict some of the deepest pains on our lives and that's just the way that goes heartache and pain difficulty and it can happen at any time but sometimes it happens a little more at christmas time we're, we're actually in a series and i'm not going to jump back into where we have been but this is this topic we charted out early on for the series and for this week prior to christmas day because many of you are already in close quarters with family today. And, uh, as I go through the message today, I do request you not point at the people around you. Elbow them unnecessarily if this, you think this is their story. Um, but we're going to talk about family. Now, even if, and you're going to be around a lot of family these next weeks. Even if you really love one another. You consider your family to be close-knit. There is just always room in family for family drama, for uh, things just to get stirred up. And it seems if there's a little bit of family drama through the year, the opportunity for it to really get big at Christmas time is always present, even in a tight-knit family. Maybe it is uh, sibling rivalries from way back that just resurface now that you're adults. Maybe it's old wounds that become raw again. Maybe it's the prodigal that, that comes home for the holiday. Maybe it's just the awkward moments that come. You're meeting new in-laws, your potential in-laws, your kids not getting along with their kids. And maybe it's just the mix and match of different worldviews colliding in close proximity. Maybe different views of God colliding in uh, close proximity to one another during this time of year. Now, you can likely find ways to get along. You can keep the focus on neutral topics and general conversations. And regardless of who's in the room, you can, you can make it work. You navigate hard conversations regularly in the workplace and with everybody else. So surely you can do it over Christmas with your family. But when it's your family or it's your house or it's your kids... You just push back the furniture and you just go at it sometimes because you just say, I cannot leave that hanging out there. I can't allow that to go unchallenged. It's when, and I know that this would never come up this week, that someone would say something about the person you voted for in the last election. I know that nothing political would ever show up in your family discussions, but it might in someone somewhere. Or what cable news you watch and how dumb you are for doing it. What kind of car you drive, how you choose to raise your kids, how, what your faith in God looks like and uh, how you choose to express that faith in God. Maybe it's something just a little bit on the vulgar side or the awkward side or the foolish side, but it's just, we're going to have to talk about this one. We can't just turn the other way and let this one go. And, so today, what I'd like to try to accomplish is to address every awkward situation you're likely to encounter in your family this Christmas and to give you an answer to every possible scenario of exactly what to say and what to do in all circumstances. I may overpromise and underdeliver on that. Actually, uh, what I want to do is, is give you some just basic sweeping principles from God's Word that are going to be really clear. Uh, about how we deal with family and all the things that come with family, the good and the bad and the ugly. 
so I'd like to draw these principles from Matthew chapter 1, and this is actually Jesus' family. And this is his heritage. This is his family tree. And a lot of, a lot of, a lot of you have probably spent some time, different segments of my family, our extended family, have delved into where we came from, who we are, how we came to be the people that we are. And, and it's also true that if you have done just a little bit of that, you dig into your background deep enough, what you're going to find is they weren't all war heroes, scholars, and uh, geniuses. You're going to find some other stories. I want to show you a picture. It's not a big, bright picture. I just took this with my cell phone. My dad has this uh, display at uh, their house. We'll be going to see them uh, this next week. That set of pictures, in, in the middle of that, that's my great-great-great-grandfather. My great-great-grandfather's on there. My great-grandfather's on there. My grandfather's on there. My dad, me, and my son, Austin, are all reflected in uh, that set of pictures. And this is what I can tell you about that group of people. They're a pretty tame crowd as some family heritages go. Pretty easy-going bunch of selves. But I can tell you this, too. In that group of men, there's some things that they're glad I'm not telling you today that you don't know. There are always things about our lives that reveal the human side of us and our faults and our failings and where we come up short, the sinful side of us. It's a family drama thing. So what we're going to do today is we're going to take a little look into Jesus' family tree, and I think we find some encouragements there. Now, this, in Matthew 1, this is Jesus and his genealogy. And I, I recognize, you start reading your Bible, those of you who take on a challenge, okay, 2020 is the year I'm going to read the whole Bible. I'm going to read big chunks of the Bible. You hit something like this, and it just, you start feeling the traction going off your your reading uh, vehicle and you just go off into the ditch on this one. I can't do it. It's too hard. It's too weird. The name's too impossible and you, you bail out on your Bible reading and, or you just pass it over. And what I'd like to say about a lot of those lists of names and particularly this one, and yeah, we're going to spend some time uh, taking the mystery off of some of these, is uh, there, there's some treasures to be found in a story like this. And there's also some drama to be found in Jesus' family and in our families. And there's also hope that no matter how broken a family tree is, how deep the wounds of family, uh, there's some good things to be found, some great things, some redemptive things, and some blessings to be discovered in family whatever it looks like today for you. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read these verses. It's a fairly long set of verses. And, and I'm going to tell you, I, I'm a Bible guy, but it's pretty tough for me too. And uh, I have this belief, though. This is something that's core to who we are as a church. We believe the Bible's the Word of God, that down to the words in this book, they're there for a reason, a purpose from God, uh, inspired by Him. So, we're going to read together. Now, also, if I get through this, some enthusiastic applause would be really appreciated. Here we go. An account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac, Isaac fathered Jacob, Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers. Judah fathered Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Aram, Aram fathered Amminadab, Amminadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab, Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. Obed fathered Jesse. Jesse fathered King David. David fathered Solomon by Uriah's wife. Solomon fathered Rehoboam. Rehoboam fathered Abijah. Abijah fathered Asa. Asa fathered Jehoshaphat. 
Jehoshaphat fathered Joram. Joram fathered Uzziah. Uzziah fathered Jotham. Jotham fathered Ahaz. Ahaz fathered Hezekiah. Hezekiah fathered Manasseh. Manasseh fathered Ammon. Ammon fathered Josiah. Josiah fathered Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah fathered Shealtiel. Shealtiel fathered Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel fathered Abiud. Abiud fathered Eliakim. Eliakim fathered Azor. Azor fathered Zadok. Zadok fathered Achim. Achim fathered Eliud. Eliud fathered Eleazar. Eleazar fathered Mathan. Mathan fathered Jacob. Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Christ. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. And I know it came from your hearts. All right. There are four kind of big sweeping things I want to say about this listing. Uh, we spent, oh, a few years ago, we spent, a, we spent some, the whole sermon on just four of these people. Uh, and I want to start out with a quick brush at them. Jesus' family tree, the first thing you want to realize, it redeems the shameful and the shamed. A really interesting part of this list of people is that five women are listed now that is not normal for a Jewish genealogy women didn't show up in Jewish genealogies uh, often or just certainly rarely and that's because a woman in this time we're talking about the first century when Matthew's recording this had no legal rights considered second-class citizens some of you are familiar with the uh, the the official form of a holy, righteous, religious Jewish man in the first century who, when he woke up, he would pray every day a prayer of thanks, and he would pray thanking God. God, I thank you that I was not born a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. These women are listed here, and it's an interesting set of women. It's not just women. It's the ones that are listed the first one, uh, up in verse 3, Judah fathered Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Now, do you remember, I don't know how many of you, anybody named their children Tamar? Probably not. So Tamar, she, is, she enters the royal bloodline of the Messiah by doing this. She disguised herself as a prostitute, seduced her father-in-law, Judah, who is the son of Jacob, uh, later called Israel. She disguised herself as a prostitute, seduced her father-in-law so that she could become pregnant. Now, that's a crazy story. Honestly, Judah had uh, really done her wrong, denied her justice. But that's not a real happy Christmassy kind of story, is it? Genesis 38, if you want to dig into that one. The next woman that we find down in verse 5 Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. And uh, Rahab in the scriptures, Old Testament, she's referred to sometimes as Rahab the harlot. That's also something you don't want to put on your name tag at your family reunion, right? Hi, it's me, Rahab the harlot. Not complimentary as a title. A prostitute, according to, you see her in Joshua 2, Joshua 5. So what happens, Joshua sent spies into the promised land to check it out and to start with the key city if they were going to take the land, and that was Jericho. So he sends two spies in. Well, the leaders of Jericho, they know this huge mass of people is on the other side of the Jordan, and they're a little nervous about it. They find out spies have come, and they're searching for them. And Rahab, she hides the spies. She protects the spies, and she helps them to escape uh, from Jericho. And they go back and they give their report to Joshua. Now, the Bible says that in exchange for what she had done, she and her family were spared during the Battle of Jericho. Again, miraculously, the walls come down. Israel's army sweeps in, kills everybody as commanded by the Lord. They were so corrupt, so pagan, so broken, so evil uh, God said, they, they cannot continue on with you living here as their neighbors. And yet, Rahab and her family are preserved. And the Bible tells us 
that she and her family were taken into the camp of the Israelites and integrated into Israel. And then we learned she married this guy, one of the Israelites, named Salmon. Now, I would love to know the backstory to that. We, we, we get these stories like that. Well, how did, how did he decide, I think I'm going to marry Rahab the harlot. I, I think that someone from this complete pagan background, that's who I need to be married to. But somehow in God's uh, unlikely plan, she comes into the people of Israel, the people of the covenant, and she becomes King David, of David and Goliath fame who becomes King David. She's his great-great-grandmother. Ruth. Okay, now Ruth, like Tamar and Rahab, she's a Gentile. She's not one of God's covenant people. She's from Moab, which is a long-standing enemy of God's people. A lot of stuff in the Old Testament talks about the people of Moab and how they're just a constant thorn in the side of God's people, an enemy nation to Israel. She came from a pagan religion, an outsider to the covenant. And we learn about her that she married uh, one of these Israelite guys who had come to Moab uh, trying to escape a famine along with his family. But uh, she was widowed early in that marriage. But it seems that through the influence of a, a faith-filled, believing mother-in-law, she came to join God's people of faith. And she shows up in this list. She ends up marrying this guy named Boaz. And as a result, she becomes great-grandmother to famous King David. Unlikely story. We really can't move on from Ruth without making just a little bit of notation. There's a book in the Bible with her name on it. This also is an unheard something for the culture, for the day, for the times. And how did that happen? I mean, the, the Jewish people were prohibited from intermarrying with Moabites, people from Moab, according to Ezra chapter 9, unless, there was one exception, they could marry in if the person from Moab renounced all that it meant to be a person of Moab, religion, culture, everything, and embraced all that it meant to be the covenant people of God, walking in relationship to the Lord God, Creator, of heaven and earth and she did the fact that there's a book of the Bible named after a woman of Moab is one of those spots in the Bible where it's just like God shouting in the most uh, dramatic of ways grace grace that's what God can do in anybody's life now the next one's in verse 6 David fathered Solomon by Uriah's wife. And everything about that sentence is messed up. Because who is Uriah's wife? Bathsheba. David and Bathsheba. She's remembered as committing adultery with David. Some have suggested a co-conspirator with David and having her husband murdered so she could marry the king. And in spite of all that sin... And a lot of consequence that came to David and to Bathsheba because their sin was found out and they experienced consequences of sin. It's still Bathsheba that ends up marrying David and they have a son and he ends up, out of all David's sons, being not the oldest, he ends up being the next king of Israel, wise King Solomon. His mom is Bathsheba. And she gets mentioned not by name, but certainly it was clear to anyone who would read it in the genealogy of Jesus. Now, we, we got to work Mary into this story too. And Mary's named, uh, verse 16, she became pregnant with Jesus before her wedding. The child's father was not her betrothed. Uh, we have the story of how uh, miraculously conceived of the Spirit. But this scandal, you try to sell that to your family and to your neighbors, it's going to be a hard sell. There are always suspicious looks, always uh, murmuring as she walked down the street. So here we have five women, at least three were Gentiles. Three of the four were involved in sinful sexual relationships. Mary likely accused of it. 
women didn't figure prominently in the cultures of the day, but they're prominent in the biblical story. And so what, what does just that part of Jesus' genealogy teach us? I think it teaches us that God can take any, anybody's broken story, broken family, and he can write a whole new story. And that's the great hope of this set of verses. When Jesus uh, healed the blind man, and the blind man was then pressured. Okay, who is this guy? Tell us who this Jesus guy is. We need some more information about him. And how did he come to heal you from your blindness? And he says, you know, I don't know the whole thing about Jesus. I don't understand all of it, but I know this much. I was blind. I met this Jesus guy, and now I can see. And that's what Jesus does in a life. That's what God, by His grace, can do in anybody's story. And I know that, and I can say it with authority, because He did it in my life. And because He did it in my family. He can do it in yours too. Here's the second thing. Jesus' family tree transforms a, a destiny, a future now, we talked about this. We did, uh, those of you who are guests, we, we did something in early fall uh, called Walk Through the Bible, and we were walking through the Old Testament, and uh, we talked about King Solomon, and we said, King Solomon, why is King Solomon, as his, as his years went on, his life went on, he, he, he had, like David had a whole heart for God, Solomon had a heart divided in loyalty for God, not a whole heart for God. Well, uh, a dad with a divided heart for God, not really clear, committed, all in, uh, had a son named Rehoboam, according to our list here, and Rehoboam had no heart for God. The Bible says he did what was not right, what was evil, in fact, in God's sight, and he led the whole nation to do the same thing. First King 14 tells us that King Shishak of... Uh, I just throw another name in there while I'm going. Shishak. Shishak was the king of Egypt. He's not called the Pharaoh. He's always called the king. He came in. He managed to capture Jerusalem. He took away all the treasures of the palace and all the treasures of the temple. A lot of Bible scholars are going to point to that moment. In fact, the uh, I turned on the TV this morning to check the news and the channel was on Raiders of the Lost Ark, oddly enough, so it helped me out in my sermon today. But the Raiders of the Lost Ark story, well, they take this approach that it was with King Shishak that the Ark of the Covenant that contained the tablets that carried the Ten Commandments was lost, was taken. That golden chest that held the Ten Commandments was taken by King Shishak. See, this wasn't just a lost heritage in a family. This was the lost heritage of God's people, the family of God. Rehoboam's son, Abijah, didn't change the pattern much. He followed his, God's, his, son's, his father's godless footsteps, his heart not devoted to the Lord like David's heart had been devoted to the Lord. And uh, this family of faith, the family from David, they're just all over the place except close to God. And it seems like the way is lost. Everything is just doomed. But the next guy in line is this guy named Asa. And there's really not much that would indicate there's hope for success in Asa's life. In fact, we learn he has a grandmother who she's just openly in the middle of God's temple and everything else, worshiping the pagan gods of the surrounding nation, the Baal god. She's a terrible, terrible person. But Asa changes the course. And it changes the course for his own life and for the people of God and for his family. He did what was right in the Lord's sight, God's word says. And he brought religious reform to the land, and his son after him, Jehoshaphat, Asa passed it on to him, and Jehoshaphat did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. We start seeing a little bit of wavering, though, along in his life. He, he, wants, to, he wants to really follow the Lord. He makes a lot of good choices, but he's kind of keeping one toe in the water of the surrounding culture, too. And he has a son 
named Ahaz. At a time of great national crisis, enemy armies bearing down on Jerusalem, as I shared earlier, King Ahaz, not much good to say about him, twisted, evil, pagan in his religious practices, but God gives him a gift, and that gift is Isaiah. Who's such a godly man, so much focused on the holiness of God and how his people are called to be holy and like the Lord, follow the Lord, faithful to the Lord. And he offers him, offers to Ahaz that Christmassy kind of message. The Lord himself will give you a sign. See, the virgin shall conceive, have a son. You name him Emmanuel. Matthew, on down in verse 23 of chapter 1, lays hold of that prophecy. And Ahaz rejected it. And he kept on drifting further and further away from God. Now, amazingly, with nothing in between Ahaz and his son Hezekiah, as an act of God's grace, Ahaz, his son Hezekiah, is one of the most godly kings Israel would ever know. And there are great stories about Hezekiah. At times of incredible crisis in his nation, he always leans to the Lord first. Leads to the Lord, leans into the Lord only. He's found faithful over and over again. And that dad, who's, who's really a godly guy, we do see something toward the end of his life where he says, I'm going to be faithful to God, but he's kind of that father that, but I'm not worried about the next generation. I'm going to let them choose for themselves. Well, they did. Uh, and if you don't put, give input into your next generation's uh, life when it comes to things of God, you're the only one. Everybody else is trying to get a piece of him. And they got his son Manasseh. And Manasseh's the next king up. And Manasseh, he's the worst of the worst. The Bible says that Manasseh was worse than the surrounding kings that weren't even God's people. The most corrupt, most perverse of people. Manasseh's worse than those guys. Yet, under the influence of a godly priest... Even in that environment, Manasseh's son Josiah brings revival and spiritual hope and darkness where there was, but light where there was nothing but darkness in the land. Now, some of you likely have a family history that has some of that kind of pattern to it. You see the up and the down of it where really close and then far from God. You can trace it generation to generation, house to house. One generation so dramatically different than the next. And it's, it's always important, the Bible, the Bible beats the drum for this over and over and over again, how important it is to pass the baton of the faith to the next generation. If that baton is dropped, how likely it is that someone would never know God, nor the things of God. Just one generation. But the great hope of God's word is that because of our gracious Lord and precious Savior, Jesus Christ, regardless of who you come from, where you come from, what the story of your past, He's a God who can make all things new. And you can overcome any obstacle. And I'll ask you this question. Why not your generation? Why not today? I'm charting a new course for my family, a new course for the people that will come after me in my line of family. Why not today? You can be, how about this? You can be the generation that breaks the generational curse. You can be the generation that changes the path. And that generational curse, destiny, brokenness, sometimes it's, you know, divorce and or addiction or abuse or anger. But your destiny is anything Jesus can do in a life. And it can end with you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus came to rescue you from what has been. I'm telling you, regardless of your family drama and where that has marked you, damaged you, hurt you, This story of Jesus says nobody has to stay trapped. Nobody has to remain under a generational curse. Anyone can have a new life in Christ. Here's the third thing. Jesus' family tree clarifies a grander purpose for us. 
Now, this is a tough one. I want you to lean into this with me. In the story of Ruth, we see that God has this grander purpose because it's, it's pretty early in the Bible that God really breaks out. He's already said it, but we see it demonstrated in the story of Ruth. God, God has a plan for more than the Hebrew Israelite Jewish people. He so loved the world that he gave his only son. He loves everybody. And he wants everybody to know him and to love him back. And that's the story of, of Ruth. God cares about everybody's eternal soul. So as you gather for Christmas with your family, whether it's your immediate family, it's your extended family, in all the combinations that come, I just say this, make Jesus prominent in your Christmas. Not, not Jesus as an, as an appendage to things. Jesus, like my nativity scene uh, in the corner kind of thing. Not Jesus like that. Jesus prominent in the story of your Christmas this year. This is a great opportunity. It's a freak out opportunity. We share the gospel around here with a lot of people. The hardest people in the whole world to, to talk to about Jesus with, your family. Often your family. But this is a great opportunity to have some good spiritual conversations. Now, again, the hardest people in my life to share with are my family members. But God may have placed your fam you in your family gathering this year. Just shine a little bit of light of Jesus, maybe a lot of light of Jesus into that family experience. There are plenty of competitions for Christmas focus. Make Jesus the center of your Christmas. I'll also say this, don't be a jerk about it. Because you may have encountered the jerk about it. Uh, person in your family gathering too and you know, your family really doesn't know you so have a lot of humility about this be be quick with there was a time in my life I know I know my failures like you guys know my failures but I'll tell you this God's not done with me yet because I'm a long way from where I want to be but God's still working on me could I tell you what he's working on in me? Could I tell you a story about how he has touched my life? Now, don't hold back from the mission field that is your family this Christmas. We see it throughout Matthew 1 in these generations of people. Here's what God's word says. Only be on your guard. Diligently watch yourselves so that you don't forget the things your eyes have seen and so that they don't slip from your mind as long as you live. He's talking to God's people about their experience with God. Teach them to your children and your grandchildren. Teach them to your, this, teach it to your children. Teach it to your grandchildren. Don't, you don't have to apologize for loving Jesus. Now, I mentioned earlier Manasseh. He is the worst of the worst. This terrible guy. Um, here's uh, part of his offenses before the Lord. He built altars to all the stars in the sky in both, both courtyards of the Lord's temple. He put a set of pagan shrines inside the temple, all over them. The stuff Manasseh did is so off the rails. He passed his sons through the fire in Ben Hinnom Valley. He, he not only did child sacrifices, but he did them uh, of his own children. He practiced witchcraft, divination, sorcery, consulted mediums and spiritists. He did a huge amount of evil in the Lord's sight, angering him. So he was the worst. Uh, do you have family members that you say, well, I'll share with somebody, but I got families way beyond the reach of what I can do. They're, I think they're maybe beyond the reach of what God can do. Just beyond, uh, beyond hope. Well, at the end of his life, rotten King Manasseh, this is what happens in his story. When he was in distress, and this is, I mean, he is way down the road on evil. When he was in distress, he sought the favor of the Lord his God and earnestly humbled himself before the God of his ancestors and prayed to him. And the Lord was receptive to his prayer, to Manasseh's prayer. And he granted his request and brought him back to Jerusalem to his kingdom. So Manasseh came to know the Lord is God. God does miraculous things in lives. And if he can do it in Manasseh's life, he can do it in anybody's life. Fourth thing, Jesus' family tree embraces eternal promise. 
We've called this our White Elephant Christmas series. And family can be like a white elephant gift sometime. You look around at other families, you wonder, well, why did I get this gift? I'd like to trade. I'd like to trade for somebody else's family. Why do some families seem to run so smoothly without any obstacles in their path? And mine is like traversing an obstacle course, tiptoeing through a minefield every day and certainly at Christmas time together. I'll tell you this, uh, sometimes the lens you choose to look through impacts what you see, and you have so much experience with your family particularly, it, it, can, it can really shadow what is true. Most of us, in my own experience, we're better at seeing the bad than the good. We're better at seeing the deficits instead of the bonuses. We're better at seeing what's wrong with everybody and everything instead of what's possible. No matter what your family tree, I just want to encourage you in this. Some of, some of these guys, they had nothing to look back toward as to celebrate. But they were a part of the family of God. And that they celebrated. And God did miraculous, blessed things in their lives because of that family. No matter your story, no matter your heritage, your conflicts in family... There's a family and eternal home through Christ for those who place their faith in Him. And this crazy road of all these people, up, down, up, down, 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 up. You know where it leads? It leads to Jesus. And how awesome is that? It doesn't get any better than finishing the race with Jesus. The birth of Jesus came about this way. This story unfolds, and for me, it's just so simple and so miraculous. And it is so very life-changing. Jesus came from a, this gang of severely flawed people. And he lived a perfect life so that your identity, regardless of your family tree, your identity isn't wrapped around, I'm from those people. I have that baggage that I have to carry every day. N no matter where you come from or from whom you come, through Jesus Christ, your identity is all wrapped up in him. And the Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Jesus has a Christmas gift for you, all things made new. He loves you. I want you to hear that today. He loves you, and he loves, he loves your family. Jesus came to die on the cross to pay for our sins. That our sin debt would be forgiven. That we could have a relationship with God every day. And he'd make everything else the way it's supposed to be. He'd start putting together the broken pieces of us. According to his perfect plan. His perfect will. That we might know him, love him, serve him. And be with him forever in heaven. And if you've never given your life to Jesus today. Why not today? Say, I'm beginning a relationship with Jesus. I'm putting all my faith in the one who died on the cross. And was raised from the dead, surrendering my life to him. Merry, Merry Christmas.